Greetings, everyone. This is Phil Goldberg. I'm here without my usual co-conspirator, Dennis Ramundi, who is dealing with personal issues and will be back very soon. Welcome to Spirit Matters at spiritmatterstalk.com. Uh, for those of you who are new to the podcast, we invite you to uh, go to our archive, which has close to 300 interviews now over the past five or six years, and you will find them all illuminating and transformational and free. And uh, so please subscribe and so you don't miss anything. And if you're so moved, press the contribute button and uh, help us keep things free by covering our costs. So today we have with us a very interesting guest and a friend, Henry Yampolsky. Henry is a lawyer, a mediator, an educator, public speaker who serves as the assistant director for education, outreach, and conflict resolution at Virginia Tech's, the Office for Equity and Accessibility. He also teaches conflict resolution, mediation, and peace building at the university's Center for Peace Studies and Violence Prevention. He's worked on a lot of uh, complex conflicts and has taught and lectured around the world. He's also a yogi and a master level instructor of Sattva Yoga and the author of a new book called Dissolving Conflict from Within, An Inner Path for Conflict Transformation. Henry, welcome. Thank you so much, Phil. It's such a pleasure to be with you and an honor to be on your podcast. Great to have you. So let's begin where we usually begin with all our guests by giving the listeners a sense of your own spiritual journey and what brought you to the work you do. So give us an overview if you would. Sure. So my spiritual journey had a um, few highlights and more twists and turns, but I'll, I'll start with the highlights. So I came to this country as a refugee, as a Jewish refugee from Ukraine 25 years ago. And we came because at the time, Jews in Ukraine did not have a whole lot of freedom. Uh, there was a great deal of religious persecution and things were quite tumultuous uh, at that time as the former Soviet Union was breaking up. So uh, we came here to the United States to, small, to a relatively small city a uh, well-known small city, uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania. And the first part of my spiritual journey was this was actually the first time that I connected with Judaism. Uh, was it, We were able to attend synagogue, um, and for a while um, we did. And also intertwined with, with, with this journey was the immigrant experience, you know, being immigrants in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which was not a particularly diverse community. And of course, the challenges of living there without speaking English. And for my parents, going from professional jobs and careers to doing relatively basic service level uh, work. And so I thought uh, growing up in Scranton, I was 14, that if I become a lawyer, I could be the voice for people like my parents. So I went to college, I went to law school, I became a lawyer, I did a lot of civil rights work and worked. I did represent people like my parents, immigrants and refugees and uh, people who were not particularly glamorous and very often did not have a voice. And after about seven or eight years of doing this work, I was becoming more and more disillusioned. I was feeling burned out and I was feeling lost. I was feeling frankly lost. Now, uh, before that, a few years before that, I learned to meditate. I learned transcendental meditation. 
And it became a powerful tool for me just to stay focused. And first introduced me to the idea that there was something more within. And then a series of transformative events happened that began with a motorcycle. And it was motorcycles that brought me to a fateful meeting, meeting with um, our mutual friend, Anand Marotra, who was teaching a retreat in Virginia. Uh, and, uh, you know, we we're living in Philadelphia at the time. So this is a within driving distance. We came, spent some time with him. And when Anand saw, saw me first, he said, first thing he said to me was, you, you got to come to India. And then he said, maybe you won't be so serious then. And he just burst out laughing, <laughs> you know, and, 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 uh, I never really thought about India in any serious sure it was an interesting place, you know, place maybe that I wanted to visit sometime, but I had no definitive plans. And it was this conversation with Anand that really drove me. You know, I, I felt really driven to come to Rishikesh, to come to India. And that's what I did. And, and Philip, you know, as you uh, have written and spoken so many times, you know, just sometimes showing up into this crazy place does something to you. And, and it did something to me where India became my second home, where India and teachings, the powerful, profound teachings that you've dedicated your life to became my spiritual home. And at this point, I've been to India 15 times and can't wait to go back. And, and you know, Phil, when I got to India, if, if the best way that I could summarize what transpired from a spiritual perspective, you know, I, growing up Jewish, not particularly religious, but certainly exposed to Jewish traditions, you know, as a Jew, you look up. Sometimes you say, you look up and you say, oh, oy vey, right? Um, what has life brought on me? Of course, I've uh, been exposed to traditions and, you know, many indigent traditions that look down, meaning they look to the earth. But it was in India where it was profoundly clear that the way, at least the way for me, was to look within, was to look within. And fundamentally, this shifted everything for me. So everything that I thought was up became down. And everything that I thought was down became up. And, you know, as, as a lawyer, I was always curious about conflict. I was mm -hmm. curious about conflict as a mechanism because I was involved in so many. And I was seeing how people are in that. And, you know, I remember during my first visit in India and, and, and reading the Gita, reading the Bhagavad Gita, and, you know, coming to the passage where um, Krishna says to Arjuna, you know, in the midst of a battle, establish yourself in yoga and then act from there. And, you know, that, that, that phrase and, and sort of all the teachings that arose from that phrase ultimately brought me to this path. They brought me to this path and brought me to the question, how can we transform our conflict interactions? Not so that we avoid conflict, but so that the conflict experience can become a transformative experience, a constructive experience, right? Because um, Krishna does not say to Arjuna in the greatest yogic text of all, make love, not war, right? He says, you're a warrior, your job is to fight. But then he says, establish yourself in yoga and then act from there. And I, to the extent that it was possible for me, tried to adopt that as my path. And that's ultimately where I ended up, though, of course, the journey continues. That's great. Um, and that passage, as I've probably said on this podcast before, um, was so significant in my life that I memorized the um, Sanskrit mm. uh, the first time I heard it. And I, never, I don't know any Sanskrit. And it's just rang in my head and still does to this day 50 years later so mm -hmm. all these years later henry uh you're a hindu and ukraine has a jewish president mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so change does happen 
Uh, well, let's, we'll get back to that. Um, about the book, Dissolving Conflict, let me first start with the, the title, as viewers can see. Mm -hmm. Dissolving, as we usually pronounce it, has a hyphen between the S's. Dissolving. Tell us why. Mm -hmm. So this is very intentional. This is an intentional place. I didn't think it was a typo. Words. Yeah, because, you know, um, what I found working in a very Western-based system, you know, working as a lawyer, we are very solution-oriented, right? We want to find a solution for everything. The simpler it is, um, the better. But really, the solution very often it's just a solace. Um, and, and very often it simply does not go deep enough. Now, what happens when we dissolve something? When we dissolve into something and we dissolve something, the parts become indistinguishable, right? They become one. So the solution, the ultimate solution to mm. conflict is to dissolve, to become one. But of course, because, you know, I am a lawyer and I'm so used to be being in this solution focused world, um, the title was, you know, a little, a little fun, uh, having a little fun with this idea of a solution, because ultimately the solution is to dissolve. And, and you know, as, as you know, and, and again, I think as you talked in this podcast and in your books, that's the ultimate teaching of yoga, to dissolve. So dissolving and solving, I get it, very interesting. While we're on the title, the subtitle is An Inner Path for Conflict Transformation. Mm -hmm. Most of the time in the uh, world, you hear the phrase conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. You chose conflict transformation, tell us why. Because, Ultimately, when we talk about conflict resolution, the underlying assumption very often is conflict is something bad, negative, something that we need to escape, avoid control, or resolve. But I don't necessarily share the view that conflict is something negative. Conflict is conflict. And in fact, none of the uh, most powerful movements, inventions, traditions would have developed but for conflict but for someone else, for someone saying look the way we were doing things before does not work so my hope through this book is to transform our conflict experience to to to, to offer a way to transform a conflict experience from something that is very scary from something that is very destructive to hopefully something that we can approach in ways that are both transformative and restorative and also see it as an opportunity, as an opportunity for growth, as an opportunity for connection, as an opportunity for dialogue. In the um, materials for the book, uh, it says, the book offers a new paradigm for looking at, at conflict. And most of the book is a kind of very practically oriented, but how would you describe the paradigm you are referring to and the paradigm it's replacing mm. or you'd like it to replace? Sure. Well, let me talk about first the paradigm, the current paradigm. And I'm in this field, you know, and I teach conflict resolution and I have studied conflict theory and communication theory. And most of the time when you're talking about conflict resolution or conflict theory, we are talking about how to manipulate conflict from outside. Well, well we're talking about actually about two things. We're talking about a how to manipulate conflict. Right. So how could we emerge a winner in conflict? How can we advocate for our side? That's one aspect of it. The next aspect, we approach it as 
kind of a set of tools and skills that we can use to manipulate something that is ultimately seen as outside of us. And the paradigm that I'm proposing is deeply grounded in the idea, and this idea is not mine, but the idea that the source of conflict is not somewhere out there. The source of conflict is within us. So if we are interested in transforming our conflict interactions, if we are interested in engaging with each other in a more constructive way, if we are interested in developing a shared vision for moving forward, which by the way, that is something that is important because very often people will ask me, what do you think of the divisions we're currently facing? And you know how, how do we deal with this? People can't talk to each other. People can't talk within the same family. And my answer to this generally is the division is not the problem. It's lack of vision that's the problem. Vision is not something that's going to just come out from outside of us. Vision is something that we cultivate from within us. And so ultimately, the source of conflict is within us. And the source of what it takes to dissolve conflict is within us. And it's going on that inner journey, inner journey that uh, to me, in my experience, what can make the most profound differences in how we approach conflict and whether we respond to conflict, whether, whether we can move from reacting to conflict, which is mostly what we do, and when we react to conflict, what is our reaction? Our reaction is our attempt to escape, avoid, or control whoever or whatever is triggering us. So what is the response then? And you know, we tend to be very casual in English and use these words interchangeably. But I suggest they have a very, very different meaning. And my, I suggest that the word response in, in, in this context, in the context of conflict, means an action that is appropriate for the situation that arises from an undisturbed state. In other words, establish yourself in yoga first and then act from there. So the distinction is where the action is coming from. And this is fundamentally the new paradigm. It's not just the action. It's not just what we do in conflict. Do we use this technique or that technique? Do we say this thing or that thing? It's where is it coming from? And that is, to me, the most important aspect of this paradigm shift that we're talking about. So you say that uh, instead of reacting mm -hmm. to conflict with fear, avoidance, or aggression, you propose that we respond to conflict with strength, clarity, and ease. So my question is, mm -hmm. often when a conflict arises, there's a biological, a physiological reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, we go back to the what's now familiarly called the fight or flight response or flight or flight reaction. I've heard both actually. And um and that's mobilizing the body mm -hmm. for action and by action in this context of fight and flight it either means you run away or you mm -hmm. you fight and the body's mobilized for that as opposed to being mobilized to go sit down and close their eyes or you know mm -hmm. establish themselves in yoga so how do you deal with that in the heat of the moment so the first step is recognizing that, right? Recognizing that our reactions are, in essence, a software program that has been fine-tuned and loaded into us through generations of conditioning. So the first step is noticing that. But then how do we notice this? And this is why in, in the book, I talk about four, um, four principles, four dimensions of conflict transformation. The first being tuning inward, 
Say again. Tuning inward. Tuning, tuning inward. inward. Okay. Now, this is where we talk about meditation and mindfulness, but I did not want to use those words. Because, you know, the word mindfulness now is becoming so commercialized and so overused. Who knows what it means anymore? The word meditation, you know, carries a particular image and story behind it. And many people will tell you that they're not good at it. They, you know, they will have an immediate story to it. And that's why I focus on the word tuning, because ultimately it's kind of like tuning. It's tuning to an instrument. And we're as we tune in, just as, as we were walking in the forest, you know, we can tune in to what the particular bird is singing, to how the tree is moving. And then we can start sensing what is happening. So another invitation um, that I extend through the book, and again, this is going to sound very familiar to you because you're very familiar with the sources where it's coming from. But, you know, very Western approach to meditation and mindfulness is we do it to feel better. We do meditation to feel better, to have less stress, to have, you know, better productivity, whatever. I invite people to tune in, not to feel better, but to get better at feeling. And if we get better at feeling, of course, we begin with feeling ourselves, right? Noticing what is arising for us. Noticing, hey, I am feeling triggered. I am feeling triggered. And then once we are able to notice it, because most of the time, we're not. We're not even able to notice it. Most of the time, we're just acting compulsively, right? This is just a software program that I have running. You said something I don't like, boom, the software program is activated and off we go. And then maybe a day later, I say, gosh, I can't believe I, I said that. I can't believe I acted that way or I should have said something else, right? So the moment that we notice, we introduce that idea of a pause. We introduce, in essence, the opportunity that Viktor Frankl talked about that opportunity that in between a reaction and response, there is a space, right? And this is where the tuning inward, the practice of tuning inward, and this is more than mindfulness, which in, I think in a Western sense can mean, can, can have a very, very narrow meaning, right? Very narrow or so broad that it kind of could mean anything, um, depending on the commercial we're watching. Um, but tuning inward ultimately means we start attuning to ourselves. And by attuning to ourselves, we start attuning to the world environment and especially people around us. And then as we attune, we can start meeting people where they are, where they are. And this is the nature of a response. This is the nature of a response. It's not that a response is always going to be that we're going to get into a meditative state and we're going to speak very softly and quietly. An appropriate response sometimes could be to roar like a lion. It could be to really speak our truth, right? That may be what the situation is calling for. But where is it arising from? Is it arising from a place of fear, from a reactive space, or is it arising from a place where inside we're at peace? We're at ease. But we also know it's clear to us that this is what the situation is calling for. Very good. Um, <clears throat> I've heard so many times and said myself, oh, yeah, I should have paused. Mm -hmm. And I wish I'd remembered or I wish I'd noticed that I was being reactive in that moment. I wish I could go back and insert mm -hmm. a pause before I reacted. So it's the remembering and I guess cultivating a habit of, of mm -hmm. tuning in. I, would you agree that uh, the uh, steps and uh, practical advice you give in the book require some practice? Yes. Yes. 
absolutely. Look, this book is of relatively little use. If someone just reads it and says, oh, wow, this is interesting, puts it on the shelf and never opens it again. My hope with this book, and that's why I wanted to, I didn't want to write an academic book. I wanted to write something that is very accessible, that is very easy to read, something that my students could read, not to study for my exam, but to be able to deal with life. Practice is absolutely essential here. Practice is absolutely essential here. And it's also critical to have consistent practice. You know, Phil, I I, I, I am going to guess that it, 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 our experiences maybe are similar. I meet a lot of people who would say that they are on a spiritual path. And when you talk to them, they will say, well, sure, you know, I went to India and I stayed with this teacher. And then I went to India and I stayed with the other teacher and I met this Swami and this guru. And so you ask them, so what is your practice? And they will say, well, you know, sometimes I listen to this teacher in this meditation and the next day I listen to something else. So what happens? They're, they're, they, they have all these experiences, right? They've read all these great books, but nothing is changing. Anand talked about this in a, in a very powerful way, and he used a very beautiful meta metaphor for this. And he said, you know, if we're in the desert, and we're trying to dig for water. If we dig a little bit here, and then we dig a little bit there, and we find a new spot, we dig a little bit there. What are our chances to getting to water? So if we find a spot, if we start digging deep, if we start digging deep and we're digging consistently, maybe we have a chance. So this is where, you know, and people sometimes will ask me, so what practice do I recommend? What practice do I recommend? And I can tell them, you know, what worked for me, but ultimately it doesn't matter. Ultimately, I recommend a practice that they can stick to. I recommend a practice that they can stick to, to such an extent, to such an extent, that it becomes a part of their daily life mm -hmm. to such an extent that just like they would not leave their house without brushing their teeth, they would not leave their house without meditating as both make them more suitable for human consumption. Very good. Uh, Henry, um, let's talk about where the rubber meets the road. And uh, by definition, in a conflict, there are two parties, mm. two in individuals, two companies, two nations, whatever. Um, if one of them adheres sincerely to your paradigm mm -hmm. and the other does not, and the other just wants to win and dominate, then what? Mm. So, Phil, I'd like to actually start by challenging your premise a little bit. If that's okay. okay. And I'd like to challenge your premise in saying that, in my experience, actually most situations are not binary and not nearly as binary as we as mm. started by saying that most situations, most conflicts will involve two sides. Right. And they will involve two sides and, and actually a very Western approach to conflict is to say conflict is essentially a battle of two narratives, one superior, one inferior. And somehow through debate, through trial, through all these different ways that Western society is designed to deal with conflict, the truth or the superior narrative will prevail. And of course, for many, for generations, the superior narrative has been white, Anglo-Saxon, right? And coming from a particular positionality. So part of my approach to dealing with conflict, and this is where we get in some of the other principles of conflict transformation, and two critical ones, there are four, we have talked about tuning inward. There is observation without evaluation, which, by the way, Krishnamurti, J. to Krishnamurti, talked about being the highest form of intelligence. Hmm. But then, Phil, we get into expansion 
and exploration. And these, the, when we when we're talking about expansion, this means that we have to move away from the binary. Whatever issue you take, pro-life, pro-choice, gun rights, gun control, blue, red, white, and black. There is immense ambiguity, nuance, and uncertainty behind these seemingly binary slogans. So if we are to engage with conflict, we have to see it in a broader way. We cannot see it as just this battle between good or bad or white or black or this side versus that side. That is what all the algorithms want us to do because it's simple. This is what the news outlets want us to do because they want to tell a very simple story. A story where there is a clear villain and a clear hero. In my work, very rarely is there a clear villain and a clear hero. And so as someone who works with conflict, I work with the twilight. I work in the shadows. In the shadows between what someone sees as the truth and someone sees as not the truth. It is imperative, it is critical to engage with that ambiguity, nuance, and uncertainty. And then when we do, we discover that even our own beliefs are not nearly as binary and nearly as certain and nearly as rigid as we may, we may believe ourselves. So, you know, Sadhguru, one of your other guests, talks a lot about the power of, of uh, twilight, right? And so much of meditation is kind of playing between light and between, it's, it's playing with the shadow, right? You're not fully, you're kind of in this in-between state. You're not fully awake. You're not fully sleeping. You're alert. But you're also you're also maybe in a slightly altered state. Conflict is very, very similar. And the mistake that we make is looking at a conflict in a very binary way. Good. Um, we're recording this on October 12th, 2022. Mm -hmm. The holidays are coming up. And for many people, this is going to be the first holidays where they don't have the pandemic as an excuse to avoid their families. <laughs> and so the, the dreaded uh, proverbial, you know, Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner with the relatives who don't see the world the way you do in, in our polarized socio-political environment is looming. And I know there are people very anxious about this. Um, what advice do you have for mm -hmm. dealing with the conversations, not just in families, but you know, their friendships have, have been altered by the current situation. Uh, how, do you, how, do, how do you deal with it? How do you, what do you advise? Could you uh, duplicate yourself and multiply so you could be at every dinner table and meet <laughs> Well, um, I, I certainly am available to come as long as the food is good. <laughs> I, I, I'll show up and I'll work for I'll work for food, and I'm happy to uh, facilitate uh, family dinners. And I've actually have done that um, and, and led some 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 powerful conversations there. But the most important piece of advice I can give to people is let go of the illusion of persuasion. Let go of the illusion of persuasion. Again, this is a very Western idea. Yeah, very human humanistic idea that if you and I disagree, and if I come and I will show you evidence, you know, and I will quote this person and that person, and if I bring a pile of documents this big, and maybe if I use just the right techniques, right? Maybe if I take a conflict resolution course somewhere and I'm able to speak very effectively. At some point, you will say, Henry, you're right. You've persuaded me. 
this is almost unheard of <laughs> in any conflict that I have worked with. So when we let go of the idea of persuasion, right? And the idea that I somehow must persuade you to my side. The next invitation I'd like to, to extend is something we haven't talked as much, and that is observation without evaluation, right? Again, Jada Krishnamurti talked about that, talked about the ability to observe without evaluating. And I may not be getting the quote exactly right, but he said, ability to observe without evaluating is the highest form of intelligence. What does that mean? You know, if we notice just about everything we say or we think contains some form of judgment, label, evaluation, or conclusion. What if we didn't have to go there? And if you and I are engaging with each other, what if I could just spend the time listening to you? Now, listening, when I say listening, I don't mean that as you're talking, I am coming up with a more brilliant argument that I can bring up to you, nor am I coming out with another way to insult you, thinking that if I, if I just call you enough names, you'll just say, okay, enough, you're right, right? But I'm actually just listening to you. Then another aspect of it, most of our conversations are happen on a purely positional level. So I state a position, you state a position, then I attack your position. Next, I will attack you, maybe call your name. And that's how most of our discourse happens. That's all we see in politics. That's all we see in news. It's entertaining, right? It's entertaining. It has its entertaining value. But the key is for us to start moving from positions to and through interests. And for a long time in the field of conflict theory, everyone was talking about interest-based negotiations. This became very big in the labor movement. But I think interests are not enough. Because now, when we're talking about interests, which is really why you hold a particular position. So if I ask you, why do you believe that? Why do you hold this position? The real answer for many people is, I belong to an affinity group that holds this position, right? I am, I identify as blue, I identify as red, I identify as purple. People who identify that way hold this position. So that doesn't get us deep enough. So we have to engage with emotion. We have to engage with emotion, which is kind of the next layer. But even that does not get us deep enough. We have to engage with values. We have to engage with values. What are the values that we hold most, most, most dear? We may, you may identify as red, I may identify as blue. What are some of the values that maybe at least we can agree on? But then the most important layer is the layer of needs. Of? Needs, needs. And Phil, I would suggest to you it doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter what channel we're listening on television, what Twitter or Facebook group we belong to. Our needs are fundamentally going to be the same. And I actually connect the needs with our chakra system, uh, mm. as of course is very prevalent in yoga. And, I, and in my experience, most conflicts, most human conflicts revolve around seven needs. The need for security, and the need, and again, each of these has some layers and, you know, there, 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 there's some nuance in each of them, but fundamentally the need for security, the need for autonomy, the need for authenticity, the need for connection, the need for me, the, the, the need for peace, the need for meaning, and the need for expansion. And in my experience, if we can shift a conversation from positions to needs, the strategies to meet the needs could be very different. That doesn't matter. If we're talking about strategies, that's okay because by that point, the conversation is transformed. But if we can shift from positions to needs, the conversation is the dialogue, the conflict is transformed. Now, how do we do that? 
We do that by asking questions. We do that by asking questions, questions that are open-ended as possible, and questions that provide the room for someone to let the guard down, right? And to go deeper within, to go deeper within. So coming back to your original question, right? So the first idea, the, the, the first invitation is let go of the illusion of persuasion. Second one is listen. Don't try to speak, just listen, right? If we're trying to have a Thanksgiving. Third is ask questions. The final invitation, and probably the most important, if we're talking with someone we profoundly disagree with, remember the distinction, and Sadhguru talks very powerfully about that, about what is theirs and what is them. Most of us identify with all these accumulations, right? Books we've read, ideas we've gathered, all this other stuff that even this body, right? That's ultimately in a is an accumulation, and all of this is ours, but none of it is us. But none of it is us, uh, us, right? So remembering that distinction, that whatever nonsensical position someone holds about election or gun control or anything, you know, name, name, name the topic. Ultimately, there is a being beyond that position that is not identified with, with that position or defined by it. In other words, there is more to each of us than the nonsense we post on social media. We're out of time. But I have to ask you to be very, to give me a brief answer to this question. Mm -hmm. At the moment on the planet Earth, your original homeland is involved in a monumental conflict. If you were called upon by the United Nations, Mm -hmm. to intervene between Ukraine and Russia, what is the first thing you would do? So the first thing I would do is I would say it's not the time. Uh, because I've, I've said this, I think, before we started recording, you know, conflict and conflict resolution is like a joy. It's like, it's like a joke. Timing is everything. You see... Engaging as a mediator or engaging in some kind of negotiation, the parties have to be ready for that. And that means, that means few things must happen. First, there has to be acknowledgement of each other's humanity. It's not that we agree. It's not that we are on the same page, but at least we start from the assumption that we are human and we are equal. If that assumption is not there, mediation or any kind of intervention like that could be very dangerous. The second thing that has to be present there is there has to be some possibility of responsibility and accountability. Again, that is not to say that we're coming in and we're sort of standing on our knees, but we have to be willing to say we made mistakes and we are, take responsibility for it. You made mistakes. Okay, where can we go from there? If those things are not present, then interventions can become very, very dangerous. Mm. That's where you have the Chamberlain situation, right? Mm. That's where we start negotiating the non-negotiable and end up creating more violence. Uh. And just like for Arjuna, when he was facing battle, the time was to face the battle. That was not the time to make love, to make peace. That was time to face the battle. The same thing, I believe, is now happening in Ukraine. It is not time yet. 
Well, we hope the time will come and uh, wiser heads will prevail. And I hope your book uh, reaches people not only in the major global conflicts, but in the uh, the small conflicts we all have to face. And all you spiritual people don't think that your spiritual practice means you won't have conflicts. <laughs> you have more. You have more. This solving conflict from within, Henry M. Polsky, thanks so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure. Good luck. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank and you. may all your uh, good work with conflict bear fruit, and uh, we'll see less of it in the world. Take good care. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Again, uh, find us at spiritmatterstalk.com and on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe. It's free. That's good to do. And we benefit from more subscribers. And um, see you next time. Take care. <laughs>